So welcome, welcome to this uh, to this uh, um, afternoon session on uh, uh, faster adaptation, speed up adaptation implementation. Welcome to all the um, the audience that join us. Let me just briefly introduce uh, the event and the session. We know that uh, yesterday the EU launched or and presented the new adaptation strategy. And uh, uh, on behalf of the UDG Clima, the Fondazione Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change, thought to uh, organize this accompanying event to help us uh, to think uh, a little bit uh, and reflect uh, on the new adaptation strategy itself and all the challenges that are uh, facing us in the field of uh, adaptation in the in the very next future. This uh, accompanying event, if you had the chance to look uh, uh, at the program, more or less with the sessions, uh, tries to mimic the content and the sections of the of the strategy itself. And uh, perhaps uh, the uh, session that we are attending today and we, we, uh, which uh, I have the honor to chair is uh, um, perhaps I would say the more challenging because is related to uh, basically the adaptation, uh, sorry, the implementation of adaptation. So something where uh, there is definitely still a gap because while uh, the more theoretical uh, reasoning and uh, perhaps the strategic thinking uh, advanced, still uh, having effective adaptation on the ground um, presents challenges and there is a, a gap in the implementation. So we have uh, um, an outstanding group of panelists that uh, is going to help us to reflect on these issues. And uh, I think we have uh, a, perfect blend between uh, more research oriented and uh, practical uh, applied expertise. So let me very quickly introduce uh, our panelists uh, in uh, strictly in alphabetical order. So we have Jeroen Ertz, uh, head of the water and climate risk department at the Institute for Environmental Studies at the Free University of Amsterdam. We have Kirsten Aunan, senior researcher at the Climate Impact Group at the Center for International Climate Research in Oslo. Marie Schöller, policy expert, sustainable finance at the European Insurance and Occupational uh, Pension Authority, IOPA. Veronica Scotti, chairperson, public sector solution at Swiss Re, the insurance company. And last but not least, uh, Hein Pieper, chairman of the Dutch Water Authority, Rin and Issel, and board member of the Association of Dutch Water Authorities. So you see that we have uh, a representative from the research, the insurance, and uh, people that are really working with the adaptation issues in a very concrete uh, and practical way. Let me introduce myself. Good last, uh, my name is Francesco Bosello. I'm professor of economics uh, at the University Foscari of Venice and uh, also senior researcher and director of the uh, research division at CMCC, which works on climate impacts uh, and policy uh, research. Um, so let me finally remind that uh, after this session, we are going to open at 15 past 4 p.m. the high level panel. So you are very welcome to attend also the follow up of our of our session. So without uh, uh, further ado, I would like to uh, give the floor to our panelists. Uh, starting with Jeroen, uh, let me just say that after two rounds of interaction across with between panelists, we of course are going to open the floor to questions that uh, uh, we'll be collecting through the, um, through the chat. 
Uh, and uh, so basically you are kindly asked to write your question and I will try to select them and address uh, and uh, redirect to, the, to our panelists. Okay, so I think I also uh, have spoken too much perhaps. So now, uh, Jeroen, please, we follow the order in the agenda. So the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Francesco. I share my screen. Uh, do you see my screen? I think it is uh, mm. working. Uh, so thank you very much, Francesco, for uh, introducing me. So my name is Jeroen Arts. I work at the University of Amsterdam, and I'm specialized in, uh, in risk management and, uh, and flooding, uh, obviously for somebody from the Netherlands. Um, so give my, I would like to give my brief perspective of a new adaptation strategy from a risk perspective. Um, first of all, when you speak about risk, um, yeah, you need to know a, a few things. First of all, you need to, something, uh, need to know something about the natural hazards. So flooding, droughts, etc., and also which people are exposed to the natural hazards. And these elements tell you something about risk. And why is the knowledge about risk so important? Because if you know where the risk is in your area, in your municipality, in your country, then you can implement or develop adaptation measures to reduce the risk. And who is doing that? The governments do, can do something, households themselves, so individuals can do something, and the private sector can do something. And for example, insurance have a big role in reducing the risk from flooding. Now, what is our important developments, which we also have addressed in the adaptation strategy? Well, first of all, we have the possibility of, of a wealth of new data coming from satellites, for example, in the Copernicus program. We have now, for example, hourly data at a resolution of 25 kilometers on climate, on temperature, on precipitation in the so-called ERA-5 data set. And this data, this, this is global data, we can use uh, easily in our global models. For example, this is a storm surge model, which predicts the height of the water at the, uh, at the global coasts. We can use the data to predict, let's say, the water levels all around the globe in terms of water levels. So we can predict where we can expect flooding in coastal areas. Um, so this is, this is quite a novel development. It's going very quickly. Another interesting, let's say, um, data development for helping policymakers to implement adaptation is social media. This is a tool, it's online available, um, using Twitter data, so the, the tweets from people. And what you see here is actually made this, uh, this day. So I downloaded this picture today and you see all around the world in which country there are floods according to what people are tweeting around the world. So apparently there are quite some floods in Central South America, in Texas, and also in the UK today. Now, the question is obviously, is all this data, is it enough for risk management? For example, this dike, is it high enough on the data that we, that we have? Well, unfortunately it is not because there is an, a lot of other factors that play a role in why people adapt or not adapt. Uh, today it is about the implementation and sometimes we do have the risk information, but still nothing in happen, is happening. And what we see often is that people are only going to adapt and invest in adaptation after a big event and not before. And for example, we did a survey uh, in New York City in the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy. And we found out that a lot of people are still unaware that they live in flood zones. And other people also said like, well, 62% is that only after the big hurricane, the perception of their risk was elevated. And still 41% of the respondents think that climate change will not increase flood risk. So altogether, what is my story here? That despite the fact that we have a lot of risk information, that we have better data, um, uh, often it is the case that adaptation is not taking place. And this has much to do with the perception of people, with the budget and with other socioeconomic indicators. So the behavior of people, of the government, the households and insurers very much determines whether or not adaptation is taking place. So my final slide is, yes, we have new data sources from social media, high resolution global data, very good to calculate the risk. 
However, we all still still have a lot of uh, a lack of lost data, for example, from the insurance company can be improved. And there is a need to better integrate social sciences or so behavioral aspects in, uh, in our risk model to determine when we are going to implement adaptation. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeroen. Uh, very, very, very helpful. So one question that uh, uh, you can store for after is, of course, how can we use all these uh, better uh, or improved information also to increase and raise awareness? But this is something for uh, after. So our next panelist is uh, Christine Aunan. Please, Christine. The floor is yours. Okay, so um, I will um, take this opportunity to talk about um, another topic which is related to health issues and heat stress. So the adaptation strategy says that the aim of this strategy is to shift the focus to developing and rolling out solutions and not only focus on the policy planning and the awareness raising, etc. So um, uh, I will um, use this opportunity to talk about a project, uh, it's called Exhaustion. We have looked at um, how different adaptation measures to protect human health from heat stress, to what extent they are working. So, um, of course, um, we know that global warming will increase the risk of extreme events um, and extreme temperatures and including heat waves. And currently, heat waves is the most deadly climate extremes in Europe. And we have had several heat waves, very severe heat waves, um, the last decades. However, I brought this figure uh, from Gasparini et al. from 2015 to remind us that um, if we are to protect human health, we maybe shouldn't only focus on the extremes. Um, this figure shows that actually low temperatures will, is killing more people today than hot temperatures. That goes for the global situation, where the global burden of disease estimates that uh, more than 80% of current deaths attributable to non-optimal temperatures is related to cold and the rest is related to heat. So um, uh, to, just to dis, uh, explain the term optimal temperatures, that's where the mortality rates are at its minimum. So mortality increases both above and below this uh, optimal temperature. And of course that differs across uh, countries. And uh, this figure shows uh, the balance between cold related deaths and heat related deaths in four European countries. And of course this balance is different if you go to Africa or South uh, uh, East Asia, for instance, where heat uh, mortality is more important. So that's the current situation. Of course, uh, given global warming, this will change. So this is just a couple of examples from future scenarios for Europe, uh, where the first figure uh, from Gasparini again, um, shows that with a, a global warming between two to 4%, um, excess deaths from heat will probably exceed cold deaths, both in Central and Southern Europe. Um, the other a figure at the bottom here is uh, from this exhaustion project that I mentioned, uh, where we have uh, used um, climate modeling to estimate how threshold levels for um, heat is being exceeded. So there are a range of heat stress indicators, uh, humidex, uh, heat index, and apparent temperature. And just an, as an example, the threshold level will be exceeded much uh, more often in Mediterranean region, for this figure, and uh, may reach so-called very hot levels up to 80-90% per day, uh, given uh, this warming. So what about adaptation? Um, I thought I should present just a few slides regarding a study we did, a review study in the project, where we uh, reviewed um, epidemiological literature to see to what extent we can say anything about deficiency of different types of adaptation um, measures, ranging from public health prevention plans, uh, different measures to modify thermal environment, 
and behavioral changes, things you can do or people do individually. Um, there's an um, imbalance in these studies. Uh, the far majority addresses heat only. Uh, most of them addresses cities and mortality is the dominant endpoint. So very little about other endpoints like disease. Uh, what do we find? Uh, when it comes to the first type of measures, public uh, health prevention plans, uh, studies from the US and Europe consistently report preventive effects, particularly among older adults and in deprived neighborhoods of implementing such plans. And reduced heat related deaths during heat waves have reported for a range of countries. What we also find in this uh, review is that heat alert systems, when you alert when certain thresholds are being exceeded, those systems alone may not reduce mortality of heat waves, according to the findings. However, implementing more elements in heat plans definitely increases the impact. For instance, education of health workers, mapping vulnerable individuals, home visits, heat helplines, increasing hospital staff, etc. The health effects that were reported to be affected by the plans include cardiovascular, respiratory, renal and heat related diagnosis. So this is, it's not only heat, uh, um, like heat exhaustion and heat stroke, it's um, actually cardiovascular diseases is the dominant cause that's being uh, mitigated. So for the other type, a modification of thermal environment, what do we find? Uh, we find that the majority of studies look at air conditioning. And the majority of these studies report a positive impact on death and disease. Generally, there are many studies across the world showing that the sensitivity to heat is actually being reduced. And there have been attempts to investigate to what extent air conditioning is responsible for that decrease. And for instance, a study by Sera et al. Uh, last year found that uh, there was a 3 to 4% reduction in heat related deaths in Spain over a four year period. And they conclude that air conditioning is an effective heat adaptation strategy, but other factors play an equal or more important role in increasing the resilience. So air pollution is not the sole solution. So what about green and blue space, nature-based solutions, um, which have a lot of um, co-benefits associated with it for uh, yeah, air pollution and physical activ activities, etc. Uh, positive effects are reported uh, in these studies for Spain, uh, but there are inconsistent results overall across different studies. So we're not quite sure to what extent it actually protects uh, uh, health in terms of mortality particularly. There are also um, protective effects uh, reported for different housing uh, uh, adaptation measures like double glazing, insulated walls and roofs. Finally, when it comes to behavioral changes, that's what people can do themselves. Uh, there's a, a few studies investigating that avoiding strenuous activities, home ventilation, light dressing, checking weather forecasts, drink cold beverages, visiting cooling centers, etc. Uh, it may work to some extent, but the um, uh, findings in the studies are not consistent. Very consistent findings are uh, when it comes to cold effects, that thermal cold clothing combined with war warm housing can practically eliminate cold mortality. So what are the conclusions? Well, overall, there are quite few studies that actually provide quantitative evidence of the effectiveness of adaptation measures in protecting health. That does not mean that they are not efficient. It simply means that we cannot know for sure. So the evidence basis is still not too solid. Uh, most studies focus on extremes, whereas, as I showed in my introductory slide, mortality related to extreme temperatures is substantially less than the attributable to milder but non optimum temperatures. Most studies are observational studies, and there are quite few intervention studies. I think that's something that the mission on adaptation, the EU mission on adaptation, uh, will try to do something about with testing and developing. Um, uh, adaptation strategies for 200 cities, I think. Um, most evidence, as I mentioned, is reported for air conditioning and heat mortality. But then we have to remind us ourselves that um, air conditioning comes with important trade-offs for greenhouse gas emissions, increasing urban heat islands, and there are also issues related to energy poverty, blackouts, etc. 
um, there's lacking evidence on adaptation measures to avoid health effects among outdoor workers in Europe. That's practically non-existent as far as uh, our review. And worker productivity loss is maybe a, an important factor that we should pay more attention to because it has large impacts on economies. Finally, health effects of low temperatures and cold spells have received little attention in context of adaptation planning. While studies show that sensitivity to cold is not declining, as we have seen for sensitivity to heat. And when it comes to future risks, it's basically uncertain. Global warming will not protect us from cold stress, uh, but we don't know what, is the, what the future will hold. So if you want more information, you can go to our website. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Very interesting, interesting indeed, and uh, in fact, this emphasis on uh, uh, heat-related stress rather than cold, I think is quite natural in the, in the context of when we are thinking in the, in the perspective of a warming climate, but indeed, this is a very important point, and perhaps we should have some time to go back on this on this issue in the on in, during the debate. But let me now introduce and give the floor to Marie uh, Marie Schöler. Marie, please, uh, it's your turn now. <laughs> Okay, so good afternoon everyone and uh, in the next couple of minutes I would like uh, to mention a few words about the, the work of uh, the European Insurance and Occupational Pension, Pension Authority on uh, protection gap and uh, climate change related prudential policies. So first, uh, let me talk uh, a bit about uh, the sustainable finance of EOPA and also the fact that uh, we as EOPA we see uh, the insurance and pension sector having a dual role. So on one hand, of course, the sector, so the insurance and pensions, uh, they will be impacted by uh, ESG risk. And in the E, we have been in particular focusing on uh, climate change. So that's also why uh, the, the insurance sector, they need to understand and manage their exposure to ESG risk. Then the other part of uh, the role that we see for the, the pension and the insurance sector is also for them uh, to contribute to uh, reducing the risk uh, to sustainability. And of course, within sustainability, we have been uh, focusing mainly on uh, climate change. So let me just go through uh, some publications that we, we have made in 2020. So first on this aspect that the, the insurance sector is impacted by climate change risk. We have been working on um, a discussion paper looking also at natural catastrophe capital requirement. So uh, within the Solvency II framework, uh, companies are asked to hold enough capital requirement to reduce the risk of insolvency. And uh, for natural catastrophe capital requirement, we have been uh, working on looking also at how uh, to include climate change and reflect that in the capital requirement, which is risk-based. The other aspect of our work was also to look at what we call the on-risk solvency assessment. So every insurance company, they have uh, to make this uh, on-risk solvency assessment. And what we wrote an opinion about is also uh, to include climate change scenario in uh, this order for the insurance sector. And the last element on uh, for the, the insurance sector to understand and manage the exposure to climate change risk is also that we uh, recently published a sensitivity analysis. I mean, this sensitivity analysis uh, first focus on the, the transition risk, but of course also now for us, the next challenge is also be uh, to look at uh, looking at the, the physical risk and the, the impact on the uh, European insurance sector. On the other hand, and that's also a very important aspect of our work, is really that uh, we see the, the insurance sector having a clear role to contribute to climate change adaptation and mitigation. And this is also what uh, we have been working on with this concept of impact underwriting, where the, the insurance sector through their underwriting strategies 
through their pricing, through contractual terms, they have the possibility uh, to contribute to climate change mitigation and adaptation. And the last element I wanted to mention today is also our work on uh, the insurance protection gap for natural catastrophes. And uh, this element is also uh, mentioned in the new adaptation strategy from the commission that was published yesterday. And at EOPA, we really aim to address uh, the protection gap. I mean, we actually started this work by looking at the uh, historical losses for climate related events in Europe. And when we looked at these losses, so from 1980 to today, we saw that only 35% of the losses uh, were insured. So this number is relatively low and of course indicates that uh, there is a, a protection gap in Europe. Also in light in the context of climate change, I mean, where certain risks, perils, risk will increase frequency intensity. We also see that there is a risk that at some point if there are risk-based premiums and also uh, that the risk would increase then the premium would increase and then there is also a risk of affordability for the, for the policy holder as well as at some point that the risk simply might also become uninsurable and then also some companies might want uh, to risk draw coverages and all these elements put together could also contribute to a widening of uh, the protection gap. So in order to, to look at this topic, uh, we decided to develop a pilot dashboard uh, on the protection gap for natural catastrophes uh, for different type of perils, because what we also have seen is that depending on the type of perils you're looking at, the, the protection gap will vary uh, significantly and also between uh, the different member states. So that's also why we have looked at floods, for example, or windstorms or wildfire to really see that typically, uh, I mean, uh, windstorms would be better insured than other type of peril. So that's uh, what we have done in this dashboard. And really our clear message also with all the work that we have been doing and, and one way to address the protection gap could be to increase insurance penetration. But for us, what is very important is that we think that the actually prevention measures should be at the core of any solution addressing uh, the protection gap because at some point also thinking of uh, climate change if the risk increases it's extremely important to take a uh, prevention measure to also uh, ensure that the risk stays uh, insurable. So with that I uh, just have mentioned also so the references of the work that I, I talked about in this uh, presentation and also uh, the link to our website for further information. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marisa. Uh, in, the, in the meantime, we have been reached by much more uh, participants to our session that we now we have online uh, 83 people following us. So uh, really, we, we are re really, really happy for this uh, uh, huge participation. And I expect that the other session will have uh, uh, reached a similar number of attendees. So uh, now, of course, uh, it's time for uh, uh, Veronica to tell us something more. So we, we are keeping ourselves in the, under the perspective of uh, uh, the insurance companies, uh, but now we are moving more towards the private sector. So Veronica, please, uh, um, we are very keen to hear the um, point of view of an important reinsurance company. Thank you, Francesco. And just confirming everyone can hear me. Yes. Uh, so mm -hmm. indeed, um, indeed, I'm going to build a little bit on what the uh, colleagues before me have uh, already um, highlighted. And maybe the first thing I want to say is uh, obviously climate change, uh, as we heard um, from Marie and, and Christine, and, and it is really becoming an existential threat and will affect all of us independently of where we live. Uh, so I, I, I would like to emphasize that we have to operate with uh, priority and treat it as priority and urgency. But I also I went through the uh, adaptation strategy last night and I'm really heartened by the ambition that it shows both in the breadth of its scope and the targeted outcome and the call to action. And throughout the document, indeed, the role of insurance has been called out explicitly, uh, be it in contributing risk and analysis and data uh, or innovative finance for adaptation and, and resilience um, investments. So uh, I think this is, this is a very uh, prime time. The 
the industry uh, is traditionally seen as a way to compensate uh, for shocks. Uh, but insurance really has a societal benefit uh, in that it removes risks from the system because by putting explicitly a price on that risk, it creates the conditions for uh, risk reduction it, because the price will go down when I interventions uh, have taken place to, to reduce that risk. And also it allows the risk transfer a more equitable uh, distribution uh, of that financial exposure. So I think these are both really key steps to stimulating uh, the investment for climate adaptation and for accelerating uh, project uh, funding. And myself within the organization, we've been really uh, testing and playing with that um, a little bit. So I want to use my, my five minutes to share with this community what we are doing already. And in particular, um, in driving adaptation at scale, because that's, as we was noted by Francesco, that's where we have the biggest gap. And I'm gonna focus on three aspects, uh, risk insight, uh, risk transfer and partnership for actions, um, all of which I think are essential. So on the inside uh, front, we, we heard it already from um, uh, Giro that um, we, the industry has knowledge and experience and can help shape common metrics and uh, tools and practices that help drive uh, a change in behavior. Concretely, I'll give, um, I want to be really practical. So as a company, for instance, over 20 years ago, we uh, established a tool, which is now a portal uh, called CatNet. And it's currently used by 15,000 insurance professionals that underwrite around the world uh, and by a number of uh, government staffers and academia as well. And um, through this tool, we continue to innovate and integrate uh, capabilities. So most recently we've integrated uh, biosystemic and ecosystem impacts uh, assessments. Uh, we've integrated climate scenarios uh, that project all the way out to the end of the uh, century. Um, and next, we're also working on event footprints so that immediately after an event, we can see what the loss um, with reliability and, and credibility looks like. Once you put all of this information together, the historical uh, data about past losses, the simulation and the loss scenarios uh, that are probabilistic, the environmental impact, the climate scenarios, the live event footprints, you have under one-stop shop an ability to make uh, project planning and decisions that I think also governments uh, need to be able to build back better and embed preparedness um, uh, for the future against other shocks. So that I, I think this is something that as an industry we can and should look to uh, socialize ever more. The second topic is uh, where I think um, Marie was going in terms of risk transfer and, uh, and the role that we play in helping governments take decisions about efficient and effective allocation of funds. So from a systemic exante risk management perspective, um, you, you can say that not protecting uh, a risk is not uh, a good practice um, and, and, and it's not necessarily the strategy that will deliver societal resilience. In the context of Europe, we've heard it already, uh, there are a number of, um, of, uh, of protections and exposures, but the, the biggest gaps are around flood, drought and heat wave. Uh, and, and I think you may be able to see a table at the moment. So um, it was mentioned around 35% of all natural uh, climate related catastrophes currently are insured in Europe. Uh, but when you look specifically at flood and, and drought and heat waves, I'm gonna say that number is way below 10%. And uh, these losses, because they're escalating and becoming more frequent, are going to uh, create a, a growing burden on the shoulders of societies and governments in particular, who foot the bill when things are not prepared for. Um, so I don't have the time to go into all the risks. I'm happy to take uh, further questions on that, but I'm gonna focus on flood for now because it's the peak risk within Europe at this point in time. And uh, very quickly, only four countries, only four member states, uh, France, Belgium, UK and Spain, today have national flood schemes. 
um, and uh, everywhere else it, all, it is all left to voluntary insurance uh, take up and we've heard uh, from the first speaker that you know that remains extremely low at this point uh, but these scenarios can be protected against and uh, we have offered a number of uh, proposals to, to, to the members of the European Union to address uh, either financial costs following emergencies uh, for reconstruction and recovery or looking at specific areas where there are peak risks for residential uh, purposes, for instance. And, and the, um, the, the point that I want to drive is that what happened, for instance, in Serbia in, uh, in May 2014 with very heavy losses can become a picture for Europe without better preparedness at large. Because at the time, uh, the losses, the flood losses were so severe that they triggered a, a recession of the economy. The GDP contracted by 1.8 percentage points. Uh, over 22 percent of the population was affected. Two thirds of the municipalities were affected, over 30% of the energy sector was affected with also impact on agriculture, tourism, uh, transport. And by October of the following year, so a good year and a half later, 62% of emergency reconstruction costs were still unfunded. So that's not um, how we can handle um, you know, emergency situations, and especially if they become very frequent, it becomes very uh, unproposable also towards our citizens. The other aspect that I want to touch upon uh, is the sea level rising and, and storm surges, which have huge cascading effects on, on ports, on, on municipalities, on commerce, on manufacturing. And uh, as we know, 40% of Europe lives by the coast. So in a context of other to, to storm, we need to work on upgrading uh, our infrastructures. And um, a good example that I can offer is, for instance, what we've done with the island of Texel in the Netherlands in connection with the Prince Hendrik Sand Dyke, uh, which is both an exercise in protecting against erosion risk, but also applying uh, in a smart way uh, nature. And because we grade that infrastructure and currently um, as a, as a result of that intervention, there is marram grasses, there is sand, uh, and, and it has become an attractive place to, to be. A million people visit it. Um, there is a co-benefit in, in enhanced fish, fish production. And uh, as part of that analysis, the government also up, updated their climate and water quality regulation. So I see a lot of these being uh, replicable across Europe. And I think what is needed is a clear encouragement to member states to make use of these positive examples that exist between schemes that have been put in place and in specific intervention to adapt with a climate sensitive um, uh, lens on uh, across other parts of the, of the Union. Uh, last and very briefly, I want to mention uh, the mission possible. So we know as part of the strategy that the EC has entrusted the uh, EIB with uh, executing and being a sort of an acceleration arm for many critical aspects of, um, of the new strategy. And with a mandate, for instance, to um, mobilize one trillion in the next 10 years in climate action investments. Uh, and so I think the industry by and large, and certainly ourselves stand really Ready to be parties of that, uh, but and, and we can do we can do that because we've actually been mobilizing ourselves. Uh, independently uh, for the last few years. Uh, so a couple of um, initiatives that maybe, um, you know, the, the, this community is interested in taking note of. Um, many companies, many European companies have actually made uh, formal pledges to net zero alliances uh, where we um, will adapt both our own operating footprint and our uh, overall business models and that of our partners by 2030 and 2050 specifically. And in this race to net zero uh, and taking actions in our own hands, uh, there are many platforms that are, as I said, heavily European inspired. The um, net, asset, um, net Zero Asset Owner Alliance is, is a very well known case. Uh, there is a, a World Economic Forum CEO uh, Climate Action Leaders Group that um, Swiss Re uh, co-chairs. Um, I'm personally a member of the European Green Deal uh, CEO Action Group. And, um, and there are uh, industry-level initiatives 
that Marie referred to with the UNEPFI, uh, first around the principle of sustainable investments, but now more recently, we've just launched our first draft for the uh, principle of sustainable um, insurance underwriting. And uh, just to touch upon the, the, the capital mobilization, the industry today represents 30 trillion of assets under management. That's um, about a third of the uh, global long-term investors base and 30% of that 85 trillions sits in Europe. And this is a group that I can tell you is absolutely has the desire and the capabilities to mobilize itself to facilitate more adaptation and just transition. But we need to work obviously with, um, with the uh, politician, the European Commission, <coughs> sorry, and the regulators to ensure that this capacity, <clears throat> apologies, are, is mostly directed towards uh, appropriate standard settings so that we have standardized uh, practices and also regulatory environments that recognize the asset classes that we want to invest into and that work is, is underway. Um, and one last point that has not been mentioned so far, but I think it is uh, so interlinked to the discussion of adaptation is um, carbon removal uh, created markets. So. This year, um, and we're one of very few companies globally, we decided to introduce $100 per ton levy uh, for, our, um, for our own activities. And it has two intentions. First, change the way we consume as a company. But secondly, the levy will, and, and the money that we collected through the levy that we apply to ourselves, goes into funding um, carbon capture, utilization and storage space investment indirectly, because those are the industry that will allow to create um, a carbon removal market eventually. So I think it is it's extremely important that we make use of the industry capacity uh, to, to really move very fast technology for uh, risk underwriting, technology for risk assessment, technology and standards for sustainability practices and for investments to make sure that this expertise is made available towards transforming Europe in this, into the globally leading example of a uh, equitable and climate resilient society. Thank you. Thank you very much for these uh, further very very interesting and stimulating and stimulating presentation one one issue that comes immediately to my mind that perhaps we could e explore afterwards is uh, uh, the point of uh, or the issue of moral hazard and the, the fact that for instance many times uh, there are public support to uh, disaster relief may induce people to be less cautious and what is the role that insurance could play in this but perhaps these two provocative because it seems that people are happy to be flooded just because there is <laughs> there is a public uh, coverage of the losses and this is absolutely not the case but i think that this is something that needs to be taken into account especially in stimulating a public private partnership and so and uh, there should be a joint action by the public and the private sectors to uh, a better distribution and more equitable also distribution of losses i, I guess but we can leave this for later discussion and we have our uh, last but not least panelist Hein Pieper and we are very keen to know your point of view and your perspective. So the floor is yours Hein. Yeah, thank so, you very much. Uh, I think the, 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 the slides. The, yes, there will be. There, there will be slides. Yes. They are coming. On the eighth day, he said, here, here they are. <laughs> there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, no, the first, not so uh, fast. Um, I would like to say a, a few words about um, implementation uh, on climate adaptation in the Netherlands. And I will do that by telling something about our water authorities in the Netherlands. And they are very old institutions. They are older than our country. They are almost 900 years old. And they are um, responsible for the, the safety of our country. And as you can see in, on, on this slide, that if we had no dikes in the Netherlands, 
almost 60% of our country was flooded, was uh, gone, and um, we had to regain it by re rebuilding our dikes. We are also uh, uh, responsible for the, ma the maintenance of the water system in the Netherlands for the rivers and the, the smaller lakes, etc. And we are responsible for the uh, purification of the wastewater. We are similar like municipalities or regions, uh, independent government institutions. We have our own board, we have our own elections. And in our board, the most important stakeholders, the most uh, important landowners, nature organizations, farmers, but also uh, businesses have their own seats. Most of the seats are for the citizens, but our most important stakeholders are on board. So they are always directly involved and committed to the political um, considerations of our policy. Another thing is we have our own tax system. That means we can collect taxes for our own tasks. And that's the water management in the Netherlands. And we uh, have about, I think, 3 billion euros a year. So we spend that on, on our water system, our, our, our dikes, uh, the wastewater purification. And we don't have to spend uh, it on education or on healthcare or in infrastructure or defense. This money is earmarked for water management in the Netherlands. After the Second World War, it was difficult to have access, access to money. So we established our own bank. We have a water authority bank in the Netherlands. And maybe it's not important, but it's the fifth safest bank in the world. And there we can uh, borrow money very cheaply. So if you have to spend money and we can't, we have investment, big investments uh, for the next, uh, for example, for the dikes, and they will be there for 50 or, or 30 years, we can borrow money from our own bank. And that can be money from China or from uh, America. Um, after the war, there was a big desire in the Netherlands to have no hunger and eh? to have no longer wanted to be the, the Dutch government no longer wanted to have food shortages. So the water authorities have arranged that the water system in the Netherlands is uh, uh, sufficient, uh, organized for a good agriculture. It's an optimum in the Netherlands. And that, I think, uh, 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 led that the Netherlands is today the second largest exporter of agriculture products worldwide. Such a small country. And it's depends, the agriculture depends on water, uh, on, uh, yes, on the water system. That's something about what we can arrange. We have a good system, we have a good government structure, we have our own tax system. But this was in the old, or in the days of the old climate. Now we go to the second slide. The Netherlands is changing. The climate is changing our country. Sea levels are rising. Uh, our rivers are getting more and more water peaks. And therefore, we in the Netherlands have drawn up a Delta program until 2100. In the next 80 years, we have a program where we maintain our dikes for sea level rising and we maintain our rivers by making a big program to give more room for our rivers. It's a more nature-based solution. So we are acting 
for the next 80 years already. And it is a Delta program who is, that is led by a Delta commissioner, not by a minister, not by the government. They are a part of it, like the water authorities, but we have an independent Delta commissioner. And the money that is needed for at least the next 30 years is earmarked already in a Delta fund. So our finance system will provide in the next, for the next 30 years enough money to maintain our dikes. But the Delta is also in danger of drying up. The last three summers learned the Netherlands that flooding is not the biggest problem for the Delta. It's the drought. And the damage that is caused by the drought is probably has a bigger impact than the floods. So now we are working on a Delta program for drought. And I think it will be a, a big program of billions like the Delta program for floods. It will be more nature-based solution. Uh, we, we are looking more how we can work with nature than against. And that's something quite different in the Netherlands because we all, in the, in the last centuries, we always were protecting us from the water. And now we are working with water, with the climate. And we will rebuild our water system to retain more water than to drain the water out. And that's a complete other system. I am one of the uh, chairman of the president's call, you can call it, of the water authorities near the German border. And we have to work with our German neighbors. It's very important for us. A drought is a problem, but we think that our institutions will work well to solve this problem. It will take another 20 or 30 years, but the structures are well prepared for it. That's our implementation of, what, of climate uh, um, uh, adaption. You need good structures. You need earmarked money. Maybe the water authorities in the Netherlands are a kind of insurance companies, but the insurance money goes to prevention. We would not have a flood. We would like to have a lot an, an, enough water through the uh, whole year, not only in, in, in the winter or in, in spring, but also in dry summers. Next slide, please. But the Netherlands is not an island. It's a delta, yes, but it is not an island. Therefore, we started as Dutch water authorities with a partnership for action. Together with two Dutch ministries, we are sharing our knowledge in partnerships with other countries. The first goal is to achieve for 20 million people around the world in 40 catchment areas, safety, clean and sufficient water so that they are protected against drought and floods. It's an, our own money that we will spend in other countries because we think we are uh, morally obliged to do that. But we also think that we can learn a lot from other countries. They have already another climate and, and maybe by helping them, we can learn and we can also building uh, more communities, uh, learning communities all over the world. We see in, in other countries that a lot of projects are going in three steps, and that is design, build, neglect. If you spend a lot of money on a dike, two or five years later, the dike is not functioning anymore. And we think you need the three step of design, build, maintain. So then the money that is spent will maintain the dike for at least 30 or 50 years. It's an equal partnership. Last slide, please. 
to accelerate climate adaptation, we need to learn from each other. We need to share our knowledge. We would like to have the knowledge of Spain and Italy or from uh, Romania. I think acceleration means also twinning, combining strong and less strong parties or communities together. We need a less silo approach. We should combine different organizations and different sectors together. It's not about water authorities in the Netherlands. It's about water authorities and insurance companies and agriculture companies and nature conservation organizations. We should combine our knowledge, we should combine our not, uh, networks for awareness, but most of all to accelerate because time is running out the climate adaptation program for Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Hein. If you if you allow me a little joke, you just demonstrated that if you if you have institutional capacity, you have planning capacity, you have people capacity, and especially if you have funding capacity, things may work well. So, but uh, this is exactly how <laughs> I think this is life, basically. But uh, and still, there is there is a lot to do. So I, I will I will uh, quickly open the last. Uh, uh, in, I mean, a round of uh, uh, comments across so the panelists before opening the floor to question. I, I'm already collecting some from the from the audience, but uh, I would like to stimulate a little bit of uh, very quick, uh, very quick comment uh, on uh, or um, room for uh, um, deepen some of the concepts. So. We say that we would have uh, followed that uh, a reverse order. So. Uh, Hein was the last to speak, so it's, it's the first that is called upon to speak. And I just uh, take the opportunity to uh, to use one of the questions that I've received from the audience, un unless uh, he also um, wants to react on something specifically uh, said by the other panelists. That, and the question is, uh, uh, if uh, and how a kind of adaptation risk uh, is taken into account in planning? I think that uh, by adaptation, risk, uh, it is meant that the possibility that there is a failure of uh, uh, the, the planned adaptation measure that have been uh, foreseen. So these are very practical, very practical questions. But of course, you, 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 are, you are also welcome to store the question for uh, afterwards and uh, re uh, comment on uh, something that uh, interested you particularly uh, taken from the presentation of your colleagues, as you wish. Thank you very much. Now, the, 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 uh, the, starting with the last uh, question uh, of point, is I, I would like to uh, ask my colleagues, can we uh, build a network without a silo approach that we are uh, leaving our island? Of course, the Dutch water authorities are also an island. We are, we are uh, not able to do all the things that are necessary. Yeah? But we... We, can, we could share, and I, we would look, uh, do that on, on, on a um, basis of, of not on profit, but uh, on uh, solidarity. That's for us in the Netherlands is very important. Uh, water authorities are, are coming from an age where the common goods were very important, more important than making profit. And so for me, it's, it's a question for the other uh, panelists. Can we find a more common future? Okay, thank you. Uh, Veronica, so we are following the reverse order. So also sure. I will ask you a quick uh, uh, reply just to leave room for to, to our uh, audience. So you are perhaps you, you are very welcome to expand a little bit on the issue of moral hazard and public uh, public sure. or perhaps you want to uh, tell us something more about the droughts uh, uh, how, the, how Swiss Re is addressing the droughts uh, uh,
problem basically. Let me let me go with your inquiry and, and what Heinz just mm. um, left open as an invitation. Uh. So, um, absolutely, I think there is a perception that um, uh, I fight. I don't want to say a fight against, but it disheartens me if there is an idea that companies are all about profit. Because frankly, to profit, you need to have clients and customers that appreciate and can afford your products. And so, if we're looking at a society where you know. Um, let me maybe make a dramatic point, uh, building on Kristen's uh, presentation. In, uh, by 2100, uh, if we do not adapt to the increasing heat, 50% of the European population is at risk of dying. These are the projections. These are not my projections, right? So um, what good does it do to insurance companies if 50% of their customers are dead? So, I mean, if you even want to turn it that way, I think, you know, uh, you should, we are all in this together. We absolutely are committed to do what we can and more. And I think it's um, the examples about the mission possible partnerships that I was highlighting before uh, were really intended to is still at, at one level, a sense of hope, but most importantly, a sense of agency. All of those initiatives were not coordinated by governments. They did not take 15 years to happen. We just sat together and said, this is not good. We're not happy to wait. Let's get together. Let's put money together. Let's put resources together and make it happen. So, for instance, the uh, Climate Leader Action Group, has produced a study that we all believe we needed cross-sectorially, across 12 sectors, about how do you adapt in those sectors to reach the 2050 targets. And this is some, and I know it's not adaptation strict census, but it's an important message. We found out that to change complete, looking at the entire value chain, there are parts of sectors that will um, very easily adapt ourselves, we have a very small physical footprint. We are a knowledge company. For us, it's easy to adapt. But if you are in cement manufacturing and your profit margins are super thin and you're one of the hard to abate industries, adapting exclusively yourself to produce net zero by 2050 is super expensive, super expensive. So we need to look at how do we take that cost and look across the various people that are attached to this value chain and we redistribute. And adapting in certain sectors, the cost on average, we just completed the study two months ago, is anything between four and 8%. That's the difference in, in the final price of the good between something that is green and something that is not green end to end. I think it's absolutely doable. What it means is that we need to socialize that cost. So Ryan, absolutely, I'm with you. Let's join forces because it's not impossible. It's, it's as Francesco said, it's who's got the money where and can we find sufficient alignment to make it happen? And I believe it is becoming paramount that we work in a much more joined up uh, way. But, um, but maybe, maybe to your point, Francesca, and then I'll, I'll pause, you raised a super interesting question about the moral hazard. And uh, I think it was Jerome before that talked about um, uh, behavioral economics and, and, you know, and the positive biases. This is not gonna affect me uh, or the negationist, you know, climate doesn't exist. The, the reality is we have at the moment explicit disincentives to, uh, for, for people to take agency and responsibility. Because in as far as the principle of solidarity uh, comes a thought with personal accountability, we are not gonna get the action at scale. That's my, my belief. So I think solidarity is fundamental in the civil society in which we live, and I absolutely live and uh, by it. But that doesn't mean that we should not take personal responsibility for making changes and for adapting, whether it's our houses, and then we want to look at sewer backup and ad adaptation against flood, whether it is around codes that require us to change zoning, lending, permits, et cetera, et cetera. And that's something that governments can intervene with, whether it's around the construction industry that can, in fact, 
with a, a, an increase in price of anything between eight and 10% can actually produce more fire heat resistant, better material uh, with lower uh, green impact, all of that. And for us as an insurance industry to actually uh, be willing to support, to sustain some of the additional costs that are associated with building back better. I've had many discussions with my peers following a, a, um, a wildfire where cities, entire cities have been destroyed. I think we should help municipalities and individuals by actually uh, affording a little bit more of the cost than what is in the policy, provided that we build back better. Otherwise, we are just waiting for the next disaster to strike. And again, we're going to erase everything back to zero. But it cannot happen that if there isn't a joined up approach, I guess that's my message. And governments need to take responsibility for the fact that they are not creating positive incentives. In fact, they are creating disincentives by not demanding protection, by not creating maybe funding if needed to for affordability for, for a part of the population. We, today we have, 100% or 95% of the population not protected uh, because 5% of it cannot afford it. To me, that's distortive. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, we cannot agree more on that. Of course, in the principle, then the practice is always different, <laughs> but of course, this is the way to go. And uh, uh, Marie, so the question for you, of course, is uh, what is uh, the challenges that uh, AIOPA see in all this? Yes, no, thanks a lot and uh, very interesting discussions indeed. I think one of the challenges that we have seen and uh, since we started to work on this topic of protection gap and climate change is, of course, also the accessibility of the right data. Because also when we decided to, uh, to create this uh, pilot dashboard, I mean, uh, one of our objectives was to use open source data and also have a transparent methodology so that with the idea that people would also use and try to well, get awareness on this topic, but without having it at a black box, because this is also a very challenging topic that we see. I mean, already just looking at natural catastrophe risk is challenging, but then if you add on top the, the topic of climate change, this becomes even more complex. So for us, I mean, we really try to make this uh, open source. And of course, there, there are a lot of issues. And I, I think, I mean, there are a number of uh, existing database, uh, but so on, but we have already seen that it's not easy to, to really have access to all the data necessary to make the right studies on protection gaps. So I think there, there's really a lot of work to be done also with the insurance sector, with the people who have the right knowledge and the right data to really, as mentioned before by my colleagues, to really work together because I think data is a key aspect to try to uh, understand uh, the topic first. So with that, of course, the idea is not to work in silos. I think everybody could benefit if we look at the, the insurance sector. Also thinking that, I mean, uh, Veronica, you mentioned also the number of people who could die. Uh, also just thinking just that the risk stays insurable because this is part of the, the business. So if at some point the risk is not insurable anymore, this is also a challenge for the industry, obviously. And also we as EUPA, uh, we, are, we are concerned about this. So I think indeed working together to, to address this uh, big topic is key for the future. Uh, thank you, Marie. And Kirsten is, Christine, sorry, is uh, now your turn. I, I have uh, perhaps uh, a little bit of provocative question for you because in all the presentation for, for, by your colleagues, uh, you may have not heard the word cold. So <laughs> your, your presentation was uh, really focus, focusing on the, the, the risk from, uh, the, from cold, uh, cold stress. So basically what is, uh, um, you see a gap in this? Are you suggesting some lines of uh, further, uh, are we neglecting some important issues? So what's your point of view here? Yeah, you're right. Uh, cold is not mentioned. Uh... It's not mentioned in this strategy as well. Um, it may be, seem unlogical uh, in terms of the global warming means, of course, ultra temperatures. And that's, uh, that's of course, the important part of the picture. But, my, uh, but the reason why I raise this is that I think there might be some hidden hazards out there. Uh, coal could be one of them. We don't know. I mean, most likely cold, or we don't know whether cold spells 
as I say, cold spells will continue. Global warming will not protect us for future cold spells. Um, uh, but I think uh, in many ways, and it also strikes me in the, listening to uh, the talks and reading uh, the strategy, there's, um, there's a focus on disasters, emergency preparedness, uh, it's in my mind, it's maybe too little emphasis on uh, the more slow looming hazards. Uh, in many ways, it can be uh, compared to, uh, you know, long term impacts of particulate pollution. It's not that you have uh, episodes where hospital beds are filled up. It's just uh, people dying uh, from the long term exposures. Uh, it's seven million every year uh, globally. Uh, in Europe, it's like 500 to 800,000 every year. Um, and it, um, it, uh, it may be that maybe people need disasters and emergency catastrophes to really wake up. Um, and of course, that's an important part of, of what the future might hold. But there, um, I think it would be um, useful to, to also have an eye on these more looming uh, or chronic uh, impacts that global warming will have. For instance, for as I mentioned, worker productivity. Um, we know very little about it. There are some studies, um, but obviously people in outdoor, like agriculture workers, construction workers, uh, migrant workers without um, good working conditions. Uh, I think it's quite obvious that already today and even more in the future when things get worse, uh, there will be large losses um, and that affects the economy. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about insurance and that's part of this panel, I suppose. And I'm also struggling as Veronica maybe hinted that what's the relevance for health impacts, especially mortality when it comes to insurance business. Um, and also, um, yeah, Hein, you raised the question whether we should build networks. Uh, I'm coming from the research community, and I think it's extremely important to connect with other and to do transdisciplinary work. I personally, I work at the Climate Research Institute, and we have now established a large um, uh, project uh, where we, where the aim is to link the health research community and the climate change uh, community, because that's, uh, it's very difficult to work this across disciplinary. We don't understand each other's language and the models we are using may not seem relevant for the health researchers, uh, but I don't think we can, uh, can come up with good solutions without really struggling to understand each other and do research and test um, I mentioned testing of uh, interventions. Uh, I think that's really something that's needed and where, yeah, where transdisciplinary work is really needed to do those tests in a good way. So it doesn't only look, for instance, at mortality rates or disease rates, but it also look at, it could be mental stress and all other health impacts um, or yeah, benefits of different interventions that are so important to make it um, make it attractive to people and governments to pursue. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Christine. So, if you allow me, my always uh, my, my uh, joke as usual, uh, we can uh, uh, infer from your presentation that it's not a good idea to subsidize climate change to decrease uh, cold stress mortality. So, it's not uh, it's not absolutely a good idea. Uh, so, let uh, let us. Hello, Jeroen, to uh, share his uh, thoughts and comments with us. Jeroen, of course, you are free to uh, to span uh, across uh, all the pre over all the presentation. But let me just say that uh, we already received a couple of questions from our audience that are particularly intrigued by or interested in on how we can uh, really increase awareness uh, about uh, climate change. And so you mentioned the role of behavioral aspects. So perhaps you may want to uh, also expand a little bit on that, given that, uh, and this will also address some of uh, apparently 
um, sens sensitive uh, question from uh, from our uh, uh, audience. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Francesco. And indeed, a very good question. I saw it indeed in the chat. Um, but maybe, maybe uh, a personal observation. Um, um, 10 years ago, maybe 12 years ago, when this whole um, issue of climate adaptation began to rise, I had a meeting in London with Lloyd's, uh, in a, a big insurance company. And uh, I, I gave a presentation about uh, climate change and the necessity to adapt. And then the person from Lloyd's told me, Mr. Eertz, the insurance business is a one-year business. So no long-term uh, uh, projections, whatever. And now we see the positive effect because now we have AOPA who made a very, very good document about risk assessment and the, the necessity of including climate change information, but it takes time. It takes time for large organizations to adapt to a new situation and to absorb, let's say this, this well, let's be honest, this quite complex information about, you know, from the scientists and the climate projection. So, but it works, it really works. And this is an excellent example, I think. Um, so that's, that's one. So awareness raising is ne necessary and for that, um, I also have to look at myself as a researcher. I have to be transparent and clear to communicate to, let's say, the, the people on the ground, you know, what, what kind of climate information is available? How can you use it? Um, and what, what I saw, what, what works is, uh, is indeed the continuous, uh, let's say, uh, cooperation of, okay, listening to what kind of information do users need? Uh, water authorities, uh, insurance companies. I saw in the chat also the importance of spatial planning, indeed. Uh, because adaptation is about spatial planning and uh, building something on the ground. And you have to ask yourself, okay, what kind of information do you need exactly? And this, this is not simply like uh, going to the internet and download some data and give it to the person. It's really a, about a really communication trajectory in which you communicate with each other, okay, what is the information that you need in order to make your investment climate proof? And here we have a big chance. I looked it up, but only in Europe, Every year we spend 680 billion euros on investment in infrastructure. So infrastructure on energy, transport. And here we have the chance, right? Because if we only spend, you know, a little bit of that money uh, on climate adaptation, we make these investments, which last for 20, 30 years at least, uh, climate proof. So, um, and how to do that? Well, we have to change, I think, from, let's say, um, the more short-term perspective perspective of making profits, profits on, the, on a yearly basis to a more long-term perspective, I think. And how to do that? Well, this is a cultural change. This takes time, um, but uh, the sustainable development goals can play an important role uh, to create the awareness with people and organizations that the long-term perspective uh, to, to invest in something that also is valuable in the future for our grandchildren, that that is important. Thank you. Thank you, Jeroen. And uh, now uh, we can uh, we can open uh, the floor to collect and answer the question. I will uh, I will act as a, a focal point, and uh, so uh, of course, if uh, some question will be skipped, this is my only depends only on, on my choice. So forgive me. We have already a lot of uh, questions, so we I'm already telling that we cannot address them all, but. Uh, so let's start from something that uh, is uh, directly connected with the, what uh, has just been said and that has been touched upon by all the panelists, more or less. And so this is an open question for all the panelists and not, not directly addressed to one specific uh, uh, speaker. Uh, the question is that uh, perhaps, uh, I, I'm rephrasing it a little bit, we, there is also a, a, an issue or, or a potential issue of being of a technological lock-in also in uh, in adaptation because we we know that uh, for mitigation we are talking about a total transformation on our uh, production and consumption system and perhaps something like this is in, is needed also for adaptation because uh, yes we are talking about dikes for instance but what is what if dikes are not anymore the right solution in the longer term. So, so how do you see this uh, uh, transformational adaptation ag against the, the incremental adaptation case? So is something that is too early to consider that or is something that we need to take into account already? Or are we still uh, 
somehow locked in in the traditional way in which we build things, protect things, plan things. So I think maybe ever? maybe I'll yes. I'll go first with a very very short comment. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it's somewhere midway. So the uh, there are two a number of considerations. So first of all, um, I, I believe Christian is the one who mentioned it. Uh, adaptation receives uh, a fraction of the funds compared to medication. This is well known. There is a ninety percent funding gap versus the needs, and we don't have clear-cut answers. Not, we don't have clear-cut answers about a lot of stuff, but in adaptation uh, situations in particular, uh, you know, you run a pilot because it's very local, uh, very spatially uh, specific, then you realize it may work here, but it may not work quite as well somewhere else. And, and Christy gave us some example of how that worked. Um, but I think if, you, if we all zoom out a couple of levels, uh, take for instance, food systems, we do know that there will be a lot of people more <laughs> on earth. We do know that there is a water scarcity problem uh, and, and Heinz spoke about that, accessibility, utilization, uh, circularity, et cetera, et cetera. And we do know that we need to, uh, we, we have drought as a, an, an overlaying dimension. So I tend to think about this as layers that then you integrate to define a strategy that is a very long-term strategy for the future. And that requires a number of changes, changes in consumption, changes in production, massive changes in production, uh, prob probably changes in the seeds that we use in, 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 and so on and so forth. So all of that um, has to be approached in an integrated way. But I, I believe it will take many years. And it's one of the reasons why, again, personally, uh, out of the European Green Deal, we are attached to infrastructure and agriculture as two sectors where we believe it's important that we're part of the designing of the, 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 the pilots that then will be rolled out at scale, because in both instances, we're looking at implications for good or bad that will be with us for maybe 40, 50, 60 years, right? And so we need to think very hard today of how we make those choices uh, and consider all aspects um, from the social justice, the cost, uh, the potential side effects. You know, if we move towards cultivars that are more climate resistant, but maybe they're engineered, ge genetically engineered, what does that mean? I'm, I'm not an agronomist, but we have to ask that question because we want to do the right thing. So I would like to ensure it, but I also need to make sure that this is not conflicting with other ESG principles. Um, and that would be my answer to, to your question, Francesco. Yes. To our audience questions. <laughs> yes. I can make a comment as well. Yes, of course. Uh, I absolutely support what Veronica says about making sure that the different uh, adaptation measures or actions do not conflict with other uh, targets. So, and um, I was just thinking about this EU's taxonomy, uh, whether that's relevant in this context, um, which is about uh, uh, hindering that uh, certain actions is uh, conflicting with other targets and also the sustainable. So this could be a guidance uh, kind of tool, in, at least for certain situations. And the same goes for sustainable development goals, of course. Um, if it's uh, made more systematic that uh, when, decisions make, when decisions are being made, uh, one has to strive for taking a broader perspective than just the pure, the primary target of the uh, action. Thank you. I don't know if there are other comments. On May this. I? Uh, yes, of course. Francesco. Please. Absolutely. It's, it's a nice um, example uh, if you take the dikes. In the Netherlands, it was also always to uh, um, uh, um, building bigger and, and better and higher dikes to protect us from uh, the water. Uh, uh, Almost 20 years back, we uh, made a program called Room for the River. And we broadened the river. We gave it more space. So it's also always also a possibility to, to retain the water longer. 
And um, what we did, um, there is also an awareness problem there because the, the, the inhabitants in that region, they, you have to uh, um, speak with them and <laughs> tell them, we don't hire the dikes anymore, right? we, we are uh, doing something else. And, and then um, you have to combine it with other things. You can combine it with uh, tourism or you can combine it with uh, nature or you combine it with uh, more possibilities for building houses or something else. And then you get uh, more support from inhabitants. And it's, it's, it's always, that's my uh, experience, is always uh, something of combining with other values, with other things in society. It's not uh, uh, one thing, what we did in the past, and uh, only safety. But nowadays it's safety and economy, it's safety and tourism, safety and housing, or safety and, 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 and nature. And that's, no, maybe you, in Italian, you say, thinking out of the box. Eh? Mm -hmm. And um, uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's, from my people uh, in, in my sector, oh, that's quite a step. And that you do not building bigger dikes, but that you give the river more room. And therefore, it's, it's not, I want to uh, point out a finger to others, and it's a finger goes also to ourselves, do we still do the good things that we did in the past where they were good, but are they the, what you ask, eh? are they still in the future the good things to do? So that's the question that we uh, have to ask ourselves every year of every day again, and that we are trying to do that in the Netherlands. Do we still do the, the, the good things or should we keep the dikes away? or make another water system. And that's, but it's always combining with other values in our society. Yes. Thank you, Hein, for your, uh, for your thoughts. I don't know if uh, Jeroen would like yes. to react uh, directly on this or Marie. Mm, I mean, may, maybe just briefly yes. on what Christine mentioned also on the European taxonomy. I think indeed, uh, I think definitely the, the taxonomy should help uh, to redirect investments also toward uh, adaptation activities. So I think a clear classification system was missing and now with the taxonomy, I mean, there is the mitigation, of course. I mean, there also we see a bit the, the technical screening criteria. I mean, we are looking at the threshold of greenhouse gas emissions and so on. I mean, when we are looking at adaptation is indeed sometimes more local that this adaptive specific adaptation will measure will work so i think there is all these different aspects from the mitigation but i really hope that also with uh, having uh, the, the taxonomy out and the, the technical screening criteria for adaptation activities that we will be able to finance further these type of activities absolutely yes please Yuri. Yeah, no, no, just to add to uh, certain uh, remarks here and also um, uh, to answer some of the things in the, in the, in the chats. And one of, one of the questions was, how do you, how you make these trade-offs uh, between the different, the different application types uh, between, for example, the more technical oriented measures like dikes or irrigation in, in, uh, in dry areas versus nature-based solutions. And, and what, what is mo most often used is cost-benefit analysis. But the problem is that in cost-benefit analysis, some people have difficulties to value other things that economic goods, eh? like what is the value of biodiversity, for example. Eh? And um, so, so what, what we are doing as scientists, we help now uh, policymakers to include, let's say, the value of nature, like biodiversity, into this trade-off, for example, that it's possible now. And um, uh, Mr. Hein Pieper, he, he, what, what happened in uh, 20 years ago, where we didn't have, you know, this, this advanced tools yet, these trade-off tools, the government simply says, well, we, we think that biodiversity and nature are so important that we have to include nature-based solutions in our, um, in our trade-offs and in our um, new investments. So they simply made, made a political decision actually in that, in that area. And, and you still see that, that this is happening. If you see the, the, the incentives in Europe 
to look aside of technical solutions into nature-based solutions, it's really increasing, but very slowly. Um, and there was an also another question, I think, yeah, also about values. So, um, um, so how, how, you, how do you, let's say, um, um, create, let's say, the awareness eh, uh, of those values? Well, this, this has, to, has to start on schools, so to say. Eh? So how do you educate people, and young people especially? I think that's important. Uh, that's, uh, that uh, that the, the economy is not only about making money, but it's also, uh, let's say, preserving our values into the future. I think that's really important. Um, <clears throat> and um, what also is important is to, how do you get this, this long-term perspective into policy making? Um, well, let's take the, the Netherlands exactly uh, again as an example. In the Netherlands, we said like that, that um, our meteorological institutes, that they provide the climate scenarios that have to be used by all organizations. That means if there is a certain investment in spatial planning or infrastructure, and there is always this environmental impact assessment is required there by government, by law, as in many European countries, then you also have to use these fixed climate scenarios. So this is also a way to, to let's say, to pursue this long-term perspective in daily uh, investments in infrastructure or other investments. Thank, thank you, Jeroen. So as an economist, let me debunk uh, a fake news. Econ economics is not about making money. Otherwise, I would be billionaire, I think, being an economic professor in, for 20 years almost. But uh, is to uh, use the, in the best way scarce resources. So you know, this all, sometimes also uh, allows to, to, make, uh, to make money. But this said, I think that uh, economics could uh, provide uh, a great contribution if it is able to think out of the box, of course, to the uh, mitigation and adaptation challenge. Let me just to finish, because uh, we have to stop at uh, five to four sharp in order to allow uh, um, our panelists and the, or, uh, our audience to relax a little bit before the um, the next, uh, the afternoon, the later afternoon section, the high level um, panel. Um, that uh, connects uh, with the nature based solution, but uh, emphasizing a little bit the role of local communities that uh, more than one uh, uh, question raised. So, what can be the role of uh, local communities, especially when we address uh, uh, um, or we face uh, an, uh, uh, the challenge posed by uh, adapting through um, uh, nature-based solution. There's, it seems that uh, uh, there is room for, to exploit uh, uh, local knowledge there. And uh, another question that is partly related, uh, that, but uh, um, I think it's not partly, but strictly related, how uh, um, local communities could really help in this, in adaptation, because one of uh, the, our attendees uh, fear that, uh, I mean, the challenge is so large, uh, so wide that uh, it is difficult to see how small group of people could uh, really uh, make a difference. So I, I think that this is very interesting as a, uh, a point to, uh, uh, on, on which to expand a little bit. So again, the, the feel free to to answer as you as you wish. Maybe yes. if I if yes. I can so, again, uh, yeah, Francesco. No, a very good question. And 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 to be honest, um, you are underestimating the the force of individuals. Of course, one individual cannot make a big difference. But if you aggregate all the individuals in Europe, they have a tremendous power. And we did we did actually did some calculations at the scale of Europe and looked at what can governments do in, in reducing flooding risks and what can individuals do. Uh, and it depends obviously on the situation. In, in, in my own country, it's especially the government uh, who has to act uh, building these big dikes. But in other countries, it's actually individuals and households who can do something. Now, the question is, how can you motivate people to take action? Uh, and also, for example, uh, you know, develop nature-based solutions. Well, insurance companies can play a role and they can provide the incentives for people. Well, you can lower your premium if you invest in a nature-based solution. I think of, for example, a green roof, which can collect rainwater. 
uh, it's, an, it's a good example. Um, uh, insurance companies, but also governments can also provide incentives programs. Like in France, they have big, uh, a big investment program where from the government, um, a, a sort of adap a small adaptation fund where people can use to also invest in, in climate proofing their home. Uh, so there are possibilities to stimulate individual action. And, and again, the individual action aggregated is a very powerful force. It only has to be mobilized. Yes. If you will, Francesco, I can of build course. a little bit on what Euron has just said. Um, and, and just speaking of the direct experience that I have on this point of um, micro-mobilization. Uh, so I can quote four examples that are very concrete. Uh, first of all, uh, in the context of nature base, we, my team, myself personally, right, we developed the only to date place cover ever in the world to protect coral reefs in Quintana Roo in Mexico. And, um, and, and so it, it combines three things. The first thing is protecting a reef, which is nature. <laughs> Secondly, it, it is proven scientifically to be super effective uh, against storm surge. I was mentioning some of that, and it's an alternative to, to more uh, gray type of infrastructure. But what we did in that context, we, Swiss Re paid, so I'm, I don't take the comment that was made earlier uh, at all, uh, positively. We actually paid for the creation of a job, which is the Reef Brigades, where 2,000 people got paid with, with, that live locally, local community people were trained so that when there is the next storm, they can go very quickly, collect the reefs and help with restoring them in place because we know that there is a critical window during which the restoration of the reef will either work or not work. And once it doesn't, it will take decades before it is reformed. So um, that's, that's an example of how we collaborated with the local community. Another one, I'm on the advisory board of the Intact Center of Climate Adaptation for the University of Waterloo in Canada. And we spend in the last five years, so much effort in embedding adaptation practices. One of the simple things that we did, uh, and I just give, you know, I know it's not a European example, but it's a very pertinent example, going community by community, doing what we call the adaptation weekend. Um, I can think of the municipality in Burlington where we actually uh, helped with the local shops to say, hey, if people come and buy and spend, because it's about a hundred Canadian dollars, huh? 80, 80, US, uh, 80 uh, euros, you can adapt your own basement and take care of seven out of 10 of the risks of flooding. Major, minimal cost, major benefit. And so we ran campaigns that are the adapt adaptation weekend campaign. We had to go to the municipalities, we had to speak with the mayors, they got excited and they had their adaptation weekends. That's another example. And, and we took that little step and now con connected, the Intact Center is connected to standard boards, to adaptation e efforts, uh, also a much bigger scale. Um, the next thing that we've done, now we're working with the Canadian municipalities in adaptation, there are five or six of them, specific nature-based adaptation projects. Canada is very committed to using nature as is uh, certain, some other countries also in Europe. And we're working with First Nations people because that's one of the things that you mentioned before, Francesco. There, are, there is knowledge uh, of the territory that sometimes is not fully captured. And First Nation peoples, which are, you know, the original inhabitants have a lot of knowledge about the territory and we need to try and work with them. And that's another example of how you mobilize communities that we normally don't think of. And last but not least, um, we are partners uh, of the uh, Global Commission of Adaptation, which I don't think I need to explain to this group, but we are specifically signees to the youth initiative. And the reason why I cared for that is because I believe that when you work with the young leaders of the future and you hear them, it's a bit what Hein was saying before, they open your minds to things that maybe you haven't thought of because you have a certain practice lens. But by inviting them in, it's not an us versus them, it's us together thinking for something that eventually they will inherit it from us. So those would be my uh, you know, quick reactions to how do you mobilize people on the ground? Absolutely. And uh, let me also add that uh, it would be important if uh, people start not to pose themselves uh, in a, a risky situation. So 
you know, preventing is always better than adapting ex post. So we need a proactive attitude. But uh, I think that uh, on uh, the role of local communities and uh, for the adaptation at risk solution, also Hein has may have something to add, uh, or Marie, or of course uh, Christine. I can uh, I can start, or I have uh, got yes, some associ please. associations while listening to. Um, coming back to this um, heat stress in this um, uh, context, uh, as I showed in my presentation, uh, these heat alert systems and heat plans have actually been quite uh, successful in uh, mitigating um, at least premature deaths from heat uh, waves in Europe, in many European countries. And of course, uh, um, an important part of that is related to how the local communities organize um, during an, a heat uh, event or an extreme event. And it's in, um, one part is simply, I mean, one important thing is, is that older people, people being isolated, living alone, etc., cetera, um, uh, they're vulnerable. And uh, the first thing is that they get dehydrated. So it's, uh, and over and their apartments might be too hot, etc. So it's uh, often about having uh, people knocking on their doors or calling on their phones to make sure that they are aware that they might be at risk. And to order to target that, to, to knock on the right doors, you have to know, uh, you have to know who are the vulnerable in your society. And uh, I mean, uh, then you, you absolutely need to have um, volunteers and uh, health workers that are uh, familiar with the situation in the different homes uh, across the city. So uh, you're completely dependent of, uh, of community uh, and having local knowledge to do this properly, to actually to, uh, yeah, to knock on the right doors. <laughs> Yes, maybe if I may yes. also add a few words on the, the local communities and what we have also heard a bit, some, some projects that we found as EUPA extremely interesting is also, for example, where in Norway, uh, there were, for example, claims also that were shared with municipalities and so on to really be able to take uh, better prevention measures, to know where to build the prevention measures, because it's all knowledge that needs to be shared. And this we really found extremely interesting, this type of, of pilot project to be promoted further and also to be able to to exchange and, and not in a silo. I think that's that's extremely important in this type of topic because ultimately everybody would benefit. Also in our work, we have been looking really at putting prevention measures at the core of also solutions toward climate change adaptation and mitigation, also for the insurance sector to really look at the impact of prevention measures in the premium if it's risk-based and how to also reflect that and with and without adaptation measure, also maybe to talk to the policy holder well listen if you take the prevention measure this is how the premium would look like and if not uh, that's the premium would be much much higher and of course uh, coming back also to the comment from Jeroen at the, I mean about this short time uh, horizon that is always a bit I mean it's even some comments we, we still receive today it's not only uh, 10 years ago it continues and and of course I think also there where the work that we have been doing in this area is also to be a bit looking even for non-life contracts, natural catastrophe coverages, also to think, well, is there maybe a possibility to also think of long-term insurance product which would help this adaptation and having it at the core where the policyholder would know, well, my premium discount, it's not just for the next 12 months, but maybe on a longer term, and then it would really incentivize them to take the prevention measures. But of course, I mean, there are also a number of challenges associated to that. Maybe, uh, yes, yes, thank you very much. For me, it's, it's all about responsibility. And um, we are always looking where people take responsibility in their neighborhood, in their lives, in their communities. Um, when you are building dikes, Francesco, then people are not worrying anymore about water and about safety. So the responsibility for um, the safety is going down. And that's, you, you mentioned already the word uh, moral hazard. And it's, it's always a, a, a problem when you take uh, some actions as organizations, insurance companies or science or even water authorities. And there is 
always a point that you take over the responsibility of people. And, and for me, it's very important that the responsibility stays also with the communities, with the, the person who are living there. So we are, yes, we are um, uh, looking for um, uh, uh, solidarity and, and common grounds, but we are also always trying not to take over the responsibility, but to improve it, to strengthen it. And uh, I'm, um, I see in other countries, a lot of people taking more responsibility than the Netherlands and the, the, the Dutch people are doing. So we are always looking all, to other countries also and trying to learn from them. But there is, there is uh, tension between um, building good institutions and see the responsibility of people. And I think you have to combine those and to uh, foster them both at the same time. Thank you very much. Uh, you are welcome. So we have just five minutes to go. So it, it is 10, but uh, we need some time to refresh our brain also before the very exciting high level panel that will be will start at uh, 15 past four. I would like to conclude with the one question or, or and I would uh, ask you really to 30, 30 second uh, answer. So we cannot end up uh, this uh, session without mentioning COVID uh, um, or the pandemic emergency. And uh, one comment from the audience has been, but uh, now there is this uh, huge sensitivity about, uh, about COVID and the authorities are not really uh, are, are, um, afraid to speak uh, about other risks. So this could uh, distract, uh, distract from uh, climate action, climate adaptation. I mean, I think this is not the case because uh, this is exactly the opposite, but just I want your uh, quick reply also to make uh, our audience more comfortable that uh, this is an opportunity really and not, uh, uh, and not a risk of uh, forgetting. Yes, uh, I'll, I'll go the first 20 seconds. So um, mm -hmm. to the audience that raised this very important question, absolutely, uh, where the authorities and all of us need to look at the emergency situation in front of us and, and be very responsible in the moment. Um, but then there are choices to be made as to how do we react longer term. And so if, uh, if for those of you who, who will be perusing even more, right, the European Green Deal uh, recommendations, Europe has made a commitment to condition, and I think that's a beautiful word, creating conditionality to the use of the funds to make sure that it meets the long-term strategy of being uh, carbon neutral, uh, environmentally friendly, just in its transition and still very competitive. And I think that's what we, we need to make sure the recovery uh, mechanisms uh, and there is transparency around that. So I would say it's not one or the other, but we can do both. We need recovery, we need growth, we need to get out of these lockdowns, but we need to do it very responsibly and we can. Thank you. Yeah, if I may Maddie, continue. Of course. I think at EOPA we have also in light of COVID worked on a concept shared resilience solution. And I think having also for COVID, of course, prevention measure at core of the policy measures. So I think this work, I mean, does limit ourselves to pandemic. It's also something we would apply for climate change related topics and adaptation, obviously. So I see there, there is a clear link. I mean, we need to focus on prevention measures. Yes, building resilience means building resilience uh, at uh, 360 degree, of course, uh, not working in at uh, with uh, at in silos, of course. Um, Christine, uh, I, will, I will be very short. Yes, uh, regarding COVID, I think um, uh, the lear the lessons, the encouraging lesson from this pandemic is that we have obviously learn to adapt and we adapt very quickly. People are, at least in most countries of the world, they are um, following instructions, social distancing and, and making their lives more difficult. Um, so, um, so this is um, something which this, if this could be transferred and people understand that uh, climate change is the next big wave coming and um, I could, I could be some hope in that. 
we are able to adapt if we have to. Thank you, Christine. So, uh, Hein, and to finish, I will, uh, I will leave the first, uh, the, the last, sorry, comment to Jeroen. Very good. I'm also very hopeful. The European Union was not responsible for healthcare. And in three months' time, they organized solidarity between 27 countries. And they could act in three months' time. So, it's it's very hopeful for the future. And I think we should learn the lessons from COVID for climate change and climate adaptation. Thank you, Ayn. Jeroen. Yeah, very briefly. I, I, I put a paper that we recently mm -hmm. made, a very short paper, hopefully understandable for a broad public, on the similarities between COVID and climate change. And it, re and it reflects also what Hein just said, is that as a society, as we are, if we are under pressure, we are able to cope with, with huge risk like COVID. So that, that must uh, um, make us a little bit more positive about also the challenges of climate change. And what we learn from COVID is how interconnected we are as a, as a global society. Uh, and, uh, and this also means that we have to act together. We cannot do it on our own. We have to do it together. Thank you. So, and with this uh, last round of comments, that I, th I think that is also, of course, uh, light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> we we shall see it, and perhaps we are able to see it already. Uh, I, I think we need to stop here the discussion. That uh, let me thank our panelists for the participation and for the very very valuable contribution. Thank you for your time, for being with us. And of course, we thank uh, our audience. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the contribution and the participation.